The day's events begin to clarify and we try to make sense of it for you. Frasier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6, on GB News. Hello, I'm Patrick Christie's. And I'm Mercy Moroki. Make sure that you join us Monday to Thursday, 10 a.m. until midday, right here on GB News for To The Point. We're not afraid to talk about the topics that matter to you or the big topics that always matter. We cover absolutely everything from the breaking political stories of the day to law and order, what's going on in the channel. We're not afraid to hold people to account. We always make sure we include your views on our show. Indeed, if you're thinking it, you can guarantee that we're saying it. So make sure you join the conversation with us. 10 a.m. until midday, Monday to Thursday, but to the point on GB News. I'm Dan Wilson. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wilson tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello there, it's six o'clock, I'm Michelle Dubry and this is Jupes and Co, the show where we'll get into some of the things that have got you talking and if you've been paying attention, you might have noticed I've been off for a few days. Yes, I was enjoying my Easter up north. So when I came back today, I switched on PMQs and I thought to myself, let's catch up with everything that's been going on. I was excited to see interesting conversations to be had. But I was disappointed. Why? Because it was more or less same as the old, same old. Boris Johnson, why haven't you resigned? Boris Johnson, you should resign. And on and on it went. Don't you think we deserve a little bit better? And Wimbledon has become the latest tournament to ban Russian and Belarusian com competitors. Organisers say, and I quote, it had a responsibility to limit Russia's global influence through the strongest means possible. Really? Do you think that it's the responsibility of a tennis tournament to basically enforce international relations? It's a bit bizarre to me, but what do you think? And Prince Harry, the prince that's desperate for privacy, has been at it again, this time giving interviews about how he wants to make sure his grandma, aka the Queen, has the right people around her. Really? Prince Harry is saying that? Okay, what do you think to that one? And driverless cars, apparently there's proposed changes to the highway code, which would see watching TV being okay. Well, that's great news, isn't it? If you want to watch GB News behind the wheel. But really, would you do that? Get this though, you wouldn't be allowed to use your phone. So how does that work? We'll have all that to come, but first, the latest news headlines. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Miranda Shunker in the GB newsroom. First tonight, Russia's deadline for Ukrainian troops to surrender in the besieged city of Mariupol has passed. And the country's president says thousands of people are still trapped there. At least 1,000 civilians are said to be sheltering at a steel plant, with President Zelensky warning the situation is rapidly getting worse. He says he's ready to swap Russian prisoners to secure their safe passage. He also met the European Council president, who's in Kiev, to show his solidarity. Charles Michel says the EU has so far given the country £1.25 billion worth of military aid. The paid money discussed further sanctions as well as Ukraine's application for EU membership. Meanwhile, Russia has test-launched a new addition to its nuclear arsenal. The Sarmat intercontinental ballistic missile is said to be capable of overcoming anti-missile defence systems. President Putin says it will give those who threaten Russia something to think about. The Pentagon says Moscow notified Washington ahead of the launch and the routine test is not a threat to the US. The Labour leader has accused the Prime Minister of plunging the Conservative Party into disarray after breaking Covid lockdown rules. Calling for his resignation, Sir Keir Starmer told the Commons the party of Churchill has been reduced to shouting and screaming in defence of a lawbreaker. Boris Johnson hit back, though, repeating his apology for breaching Covid rules. 
Professor Neil Ferguson broke the rules. He also resigned. The Prime Minister said that was the right thing to do. The former Health Secretary broke the rules. He too resigned. The Prime Minister tried to claim he sacked him. Why does the Prime Minister think everybody else's actions have consequences except his own? I, I thank the right honourable gentleman. I, th- I feel he's in some kind of Doctor Who time warp. We had this, uh, we had this conversation yesterday, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I've, ex- I've, ex- I've explained uh, why I bitterly regret uh, receiving an FPN. I, I, ap- I apologise uh, to the House, uh, but he asks about the actions for which I take responsibility, and I'll, I'll tell him we're going to get on uh, with delivering for the British people. More than 2,000 people were pulled from small boats in the Channel in the first three weeks of April. Figures from the Ministry of Defence show UK authorities intercepted 263 people from seven vessels, and that was just yesterday. Almost 7,000 people have crossed the Channel so far this year. The Rust movie production company linked to the fatal shooting of cinematographer Helena Hutchins has been fined over £100,000. She was killed on the movie set in October last year after a prop gun which actor Alec Baldwin was holding was discharged. A report into the incident found the production company knew that firearms safety procedures were not being followed on set and demonstrated plain indifference to employee safety. A man has been given a suspended sentence after admitting to sending a grossly offensive video of a model of Grenfell Tower being burned. Paul Pesetti pleaded guilty at Westminster Magistrates Court to filming the footage at a bonfire party in November 2018 and sharing it within WhatsApp groups. He's received a 10-week jail sentence, suspended for two years. Prince Harry may not return to the UK for the Queen's Platinum Jubilee celebrations. Speaking to NBC News' Today programme, the Duke of Sussex said security issues and everything else, as he put it, may keep him away. Harry and his wife Meghan had tea with the Queen on their way to the Invictus Games last week. He told the show he'd wanted to make sure Her Majesty was protected. It's just so nice to see her. You know, she's on. She's on great form. We always. She's always got a great sense of humour uh, with me, and I'm just making sure that she's, you know, protected and got the, the right people around. Well, her. you you make her laugh. That's what she always says. Uh, I, did you do it again? Uh, yes. Yeah, I did. Uh, both Megan and I had tea with her, so it was it was really nice to catch up with her. And you know, home home for me now is 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 you know for the time being. It's in the, it's in the, it's in the states. states. And the Kremlin says a ban on Russian and Belarusian athletes at this year's Wimbledon is unacceptable. World number two, Daniil Medvedev and Irina Sabalenka, ranked number four, will now not be part of the draw for this year's competition. Organisers say it's with sadness they will be excluding the athletes in protest at their country's actions in Ukraine. Well, on TV, online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Now it's back to Michelle. Thanks for that. Well, keeping me company until seven o'clock tonight. My panel, we've got director of the Reform Think Tank and former advisor to Ian Duncan Smith, Charlotte Pickles, and teacher and author Kevin Rooney. And we have a third guest, but they're not here yet. So I'm going to keep them a surprise until they do get here. That is for sure. Won't be long. I've got that on good authority uh, any moment now, apparently. So there you go. Anyway, you know the drill on Tubes and Co, don't you? It's not just about us here and our thoughts. It is not. It is about you as well at home and yours. What's on your mind tonight? What do you think to some of the stories that we'll be discussing? You can get in touch with me on email, gbviews at gbnews.uk. You can, of course, tweet me if that's your thing, at Michelle Jubes or at GB News. Don't forget as well, we're on YouTube, we've got an app, we're on DAB Plus Radio, we're absolutely everywhere. So wherever you are, you're very welcome tonight. Uh, David has already been in touch on the email. He's not messing around, he's, he's getting involved with two of the topics. Michelle, I'm glad you're back. Here's what he thinks. Prince Harry and Boris Johnson are a pair of clowns. 
God help us all, says David. Not messing around there. Uh, well, let's get into that um, Boris Johnson story then, shall we? Because if you watch PMQs today, uh, you will have noticed perhaps that it was what I would call same old, same old. Basically, more calls uh, from Labour and SNP uh, for Boris Johnson to resign. This, of course, is all still the whole party gate thing. Uh, but I tell you, what makes me laugh, by the way, is the hypocrisy uh, of some of these people. People because lest we forget, by the way, First Minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon, uh, she was caught breaking hair and mask rules for the second time the other day after she was snapped uh, in a barber shop, basically, without, you guessed it, uh, those face coverings. I mean, how dare she? Why wasn't she so afraid for her own safety that she was desperate to wear a cloth mask wherever she went? Uh, don't ask me. I think it's all bonkers. But Kevin Rooney, your thoughts on it all? Where do we even begin? This Mich whole Michelle, Boris Johnson resigns. Michelle, if, come you, off if it. you want me to spend ten minutes laying out my criticism of Boris Johnson and another ten or fifteen minutes laying out my criticism of Nicola Sturgeon, I could do that no problem. Personally speaking, I have a problem with both of them. But see, before we get to that, if you want me to get into a bit of the nitty gritty about those two individuals, can I say something else? Which is that. This is why I see this debate um, developing. First of all, you've got the opponents of Boris Johnston, and they will take every opportunity to slag the guy off. Now, there's, there's lots to criticise him about, don't get me wrong, but they will do anything to criticise him. You know, he will never get the benefit of the doubt if you're the Guardian newspaper, the Mirror, the Labour Party, lots of other uh, institutions. They will go for him every time. And then you get the flip side of that. So you get in the Tory papers today, like the Mail and the Express, having these articles about Nicola Sturgeon, and they're trying to slag her off. And so what we're into is the gotcha moment. So what we have is the level of debate has descended into farce and petty, pettiness, and everybody's been disingenuous. And I'll be honest with you, I'm fallible, I'm a human being. I'm tempted to score a few cheap points as well. But I, I do want to say out loud, I think it's important to try, at least try, to raise the level of political debate, because yes. at the moment, it's going nowhere. I completely agree with you. And actually, I think not only is it going nowhere, it goes around and around in circles. It's often a competition for who can be what I would call most low rent. I do, and I think actually as a nation, as a nation, I look at some of the uh, politicians that we have, and I think, quite frankly, we deserve better. I must make a caveat here. I'm among, I'm among perhaps a minority. I personally don't want Boris Johnson to resign. I think that what he's done uh, with this whole kind of cake thing, I know before you all shout at me about people that died and all the rest of it, I actually don't think that um, having a bit of cake or whatever, a gathering in your office when you've all been at work, I Michelle, don't actually think it's a sackable offence. Just on that, and, I, and I'm going to say this, and I'm not trying to score points. See, I agree with you in many respects. See, when it comes to Boris Johnston and the cake and all that, I, personally speaking, I'm sorry for the fans, people, I don't consider it a big deal on the scale of things, but this is where there is a wee issue with Boris and you can't get away from it. I'm a great believer in moral independence. And I've heard Boris Johnson talk about the importance of moral independence before. But what he did was, once he put in place those laws, which I thought were quite draconian... In quite? Terms of, yeah. Cool. And so, so once you start restricting people's freedom, the problem with Boris is that he thought in Downing Street he could exercise his own moral independence in that situation. But when other people were doing it in their situations, some were criminalised. Now, this is me not scoring a cheap point. It's just to say that there is a real issue at stake. The problem is the difficulty in trying to have an honest conversation about what the problems are versus people basically scoring cheap points. Yeah, see, Charlotte, to me, there is quite a clear difference uh, in some of these rules, the categories of rules. Don't get me wrong, I think so many of these rules were inhumane, they were cruel. Yeah. Um, but when I hear Keir Starmer say, like, I think it was yesterday in the Commons, he's telling us all this awful story um, about someone, John, I think was his name, and he's telling us, you know, the stories about how lockdown impacted them, and we hear all of these politicians standing there saying, well, so-and-so was forced to die alone, and so-and-so couldn't go to a care home, and that's why Boris Johnson, you know, shouldn't be here. I look at them and I think, oh, come off it, you lot. It was you that voted for these rules, mm -hmm. so if you're so desperate to tell us how in inhumane they were, 
what did you vote for him for in the first place? So I don't really have a lot of time, uh, personally speaking, for this kind of what I think is an agenda, just a purely political agenda to try and oust Boris Johnson. I think there are, I mean, as we've touched on, there are so many layers to this um, story. And I couldn't agree more. You know, if, if you're talking about, you know, horrendous situations where you've got a family member dying and you can't see them before they pass, you can't go to a funeral of a close friend or family, all these things, you're right. The rule should never have stopped people from doing, you know, really fundamental human activities. Um, that's one thing. But the rules were put there. And actually, the vast, vast, vast majority of the country abided by those rules. And they didn't do those things that are heartbreaking to hear about. And then you get to looking at Partygate and the fact that it isn't just the birthday cake. And I listen to the birthday cake story and I think, oh, for goodness sake, you know, kind of they were in an office. It was a surprise thing. You give a cake, fine. You know, I think the fines for that are, to be honest, slightly unfathomable. Um, but it isn't just about that incident, is it? Because the Sue Gray interim report said there are 16 different incidents that are being looked at. The Met are investigating 12 different incidents. This is a pattern, this is a culture of law-breaking at the height things, of government. Though, it's of like course. When you said 12, 16, it's basically more of the same. It's people at work in an office that got to the end of the day and basically said, oh, you know, let's have a beer, let's have this, let's have that. In the same way, by the way, uh, and everyone seems to forget this conveniently, that the Labour Party, you know, there was that Keir Starmer picture where he was stood there with a beer and he said that he was working in his office and they got or take away, etc. You know, at the end of the day, there were rules that you physically couldn't break. So, for example, you know, hospitals wouldn't have let you in to visit people when they were dying. Yeah. Funeral parlours wouldn't yeah. let you in. Yeah. But ultimately, this whole you can go out for an hour or you can't do this or you can't do that, many of the rules uh, that were more flexible or less easily pleased, shall we say, a lot of people did yeah. break them. I I, see, I think I think that's interesting. So um, I didn't go to any parties, even at work. In fact, I was locked but down in my house. Oh, it no, see, I think actually that's where that's not quite fair. So I agree with you on the cake one. There may be some other ones where that's true. But taking a suitcase down to a, a supermarket to bring it back full of booze, um, having a party in the garden, having a party in your flat above your, but your gray, workspace but gray is, I think, is different. Work, and I think it? It's, it goes yeah. to this point around, if you are the person that is standing up day in, day out and telling people this is how they should live their lives, I think there's a problem if you have both broken the law yourself and presided over a repeated culture of law breaking to then stand there and say, oh, you know, no, let's talk about something else. But Kevin, for okay. me, it all seems so petty look, given everything else look, that's going on look, in the world. I think, look, you're right, but this is where this debate really becomes problematic. Look, I know it sounds silly. I agree with both of you in so many respects. Let me explain why. I broke the rules during COVID, X amount of times. Uh, and, and, excuse me, where's the police? And, 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 where's you the know, police? And I worked the whole Details way. I, I worked the whole. I worked pad. the whole way through COVID. And by the way, when I broke the rules, this is what I mean by moral independence. Let me explain. I use my own independent judgment. Yeah. You know, I think I'm a decent human being. I want to do the right thing. I don't want to be a super spreader or anything like that. Some of the rules are so pathetic and petty, I broke them because I exercised my judgment. The issue is, with Boris, I have a bit of sympathy, quite a lot of sympathy for him, right? The problem is, if he's the guy implementing the laws yeah. that's telling other people, we're going to criminalise you and we're going to fine you, that's where the problem becomes. So I understand why you want to defend Boris, because some of the things that were rules that were broken were petty. But here's the question I have for you, Michelle, straight to you. If he's the guy that's criminalising other people for that, is that not a serious problem? I think if you're criminalising people for various different things um, and then you're not deliberately not following them yourself, there's a problem. So if he was organising raves, you know, I don't know, in a warehouse in, in Leeds, then I'd have a monumental problem with that. For me, what I think is, maybe because I've worked for so many years in offices, I do know that at the end of the day, of you get your drinks out or you have some crisps no, or you course. get gathered round. And so that, for me... Michelle, you're right, but then why do we have those stupid, pathetic rules in the first place? 
That's the problem. Why didn't, why didn't he have the spine? Why didn't he have the backbone? He keeps talking about his libertarian instincts. Where were his libertarian instincts when he caved in and allowed these laws to happen and criminalise people? But I so think is, your, I think is your you... issue, is your issue what he did? Or is your issue that he was the person telling other people you couldn't that, do it? That's my issue. My, Not my, what he did. So you're yes, cool precisely, what he did, precisely. But it's the role he, he played yes. in setting and up. Once, and once really he does two, that, once once he does that, it becomes a hypocrite, Michelle. That's yes. my point. Because you can't split those two. Because, because you did set the rules, you did demand everybody else um, lived by them, you did set up a situation where police were going to people's homes yes. or, you know, in a park and or wherever Keir it was. And Keir a hypocrite as well. And, and I think that's, I think it's probably, I do think, Michelle, you made a point. And Nicola Sturgeon's a hypocrite as well. Yes. Um, no, but well, this is but my for, point. for Nicola Sturgeon, Let's it's almost an, an even, I mean, for Nicola Sturgeon, the aggressive pursuit of restrictions, I mean, you know, far worse than, than, I mean, they were draconian here, but far worse there. So actually, it's, it, it's interesting, I think, with, with Nicola Sturgeon, because I don't think there is really a comparison with what she's done and what Boris has presided over, but because of the ferocity with which she embraced restrictions and mask wearing, I think that does make her very much a hypocrite. Yeah, but massively. Do you know how it becomes unbelievably embarrassing, though? Tell me how embarrassing this is, or tell me if you think I'm wrong about being shocked by this. The Telegraph and the Express have articles today slagging off Nicola Sturgeon because she dared to have a meeting during COVID about plans right, for yeah, Scottish independence. Non-story. That's yeah. how low yeah. and pathetic yeah. the debate sinks. Yeah. Come on, get a grip. Yeah. But as I said at the start of this, I do. I genuinely think we deserve so much better mm -hmm. than pretty much all of this. Ian uh, has been in touch on the email basically telling me uh, that I'm losing the plot pieces. <laughs> uh, buffoon Boris, his words, not mine, has to go. And by the way, uh, I'll leave you with this thought. Well, I'll leave you with two thoughts, actually, before I head to the break. My first one is... Uh, let's not forget, by the way, Boris Johnson was apparently in intensive care um, with COVID, which makes me wonder, by the way, if I was in intensive care with something, particularly something we knew little about, I'd be terrified, actually, to spend any time, any more time with anyone than I needed to. So one of the whole things that I've personally learnt from a lot of this is actually, while we were having the kind of wits scared out of us, the people in the know, they weren't that scared, were they? And the second point I'll leave you to ponder while I take a quick break is, you know, you see all these politicians now that are currently uh, relaying to us all of these horrific stories. My heart breaks every time I hear one, people dying on their own, not being able to say goodbye to loved ones, etc. Where are those same politicians now? Why aren't they standing up, by the way? Because lots of hospitals, uh, some care homes and other places, they still have what I would call deeply inhumane visitor uh, restrictions. So where are these politicians now? Why aren't they standing up all this time on saying that these restrictions are unfair, inhumane and cruel? Or is that not a vote winner? I don't know, you tell me. Anyway, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, I want to talk about Russian athletes facing basically uh, a kicking out when it comes to Wimbledon tennis. And that's not the first one, is it, by the way? Do you think uh, Russian and Belarusian uh, athletes should be allowed to compete in their games or not? I'll see you in a couple of minutes. <laughs> Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery and you can join me every weekday, six till seven on Jubes and Co. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates and strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, six till seven on Jubes and Co. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's Brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6, on GB News. Hello, I'm Patrick Christie's. And I'm Mercy Moroki. Make sure that you join us Monday to Thursday, 10am until midday, right here on GB News for To The Point. 
We're not afraid to talk about the topics that matter to you or the big topics that always matter. We cover absolutely everything from the breaking political stories of the day to law and order, what's going on in the channel. We're not afraid to hold people to account. We always make sure we include your views on our show. Indeed, if you're thinking it, you can guarantee that we're saying it. So make sure you join the conversation with us. 10 a.m. until midday, Monday to Thursday, but to the point on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello there, welcome back to Tubes & Co with me, Michelle Jubri. Just a reminder as to who's keeping me company tonight, we've got Director of the Reform Think Tank and former advisor to Ian Duncan Smith, Charlotte Pickles, teacher and author Kevin Rooney, and yes, she's arrived everybody, Director of the Centre for Labour and Social Studies, Ellie May O'Hagan. Good evening to you, Ellie, nice to have you. Uh, right, let's move on, by the way, lots of you. Um, I have to say, whenever I talk about this, um, this whole kind of party gate situation, it always divides opinions. And, you know, I get it. I understand both sentiments. is people like me that are just basically emailing in, saying, oh, please move on. And then there are other people that write in and they tell me stories, again, upsetting stories about people that they love um, that have died on their own and that they will never forgive the people that set those rules. And then, Kevin's point, uh, went on to break them. So keep your thoughts coming in. GB views at gbnews.uk but let's move on now shall we uh, Wimbledon has become the first tennis tournament to ban Russian and Belarusian players from competing due to of course their respective countries involvement in the invasion of Ukraine uh, this means that big name tennis players like world uh, number the men's world number two Daniel Med Medvedev is it is anyone a tennis yep. fan Medvedev, they're shouting in my ear as though I'm some lunatic that should know the answer to this. Um, but I've got to be honest, I'm not a massive tennis fan. Anyway, uh, former women's number one, Victoria Azarenka, she's going to miss out as well on the chance to lift the famous Wim Wimbledon trophy. Now, you know, this isn't the first time this has happened. It's not the first sport it's happened in. But there's other tournaments, by the way, such as the French Open, uh, which will allow these players, the Russian uh, Belarusian players, to compete as neutral athletes. So what do we think to this then? Do you think that basically uh, your ordinary Russian citizens should be punished for the actions of Putin. Um, when I say ordinary people, of course, a lot of sanctions are hitting the ordinary people. If we then roll it up and we, we kind of move away from so-called ordinary people and focus on elite athletes that would be representing their countries on the world stage, do you think they should be stopped from doing so? Ellie Mayo Hagen. Um, well, first of all, sorry I was late. Don't uh, worry. It's very nice to be we here. We forgive you. <laughs> um, fashionably late. Um, well, I do. Obviously, I have huge sympathy with these athletes because they're not Putin. They didn't make the decision to go to war. It's hard to know what Russian athletes think of the war because, you know, they know that they would be in trouble if they were to oppose it. So we don't really know what they think. And um, but having said that, we do know that boycotting these kind of boycotts uh, do work. So um, during apartheid South Africa, there was a boycott of South African goods. Um, and it did help create pressure to um, end apartheid. So I suppose I have quite mixed opinions on this because I do think it is unfair on those um, athletes and on all of the other people who have found themselves uh, not performing. For example, musicians have been told they can't perform and things like that. I think it is deeply unfair. But I do understand the reasons behind it. It's to isolate Russia and to create a situation where the war is untenable and to make Putin unpopular with his own people. So I understand it, um, but obviously these people have, as far as we know, we don't know what their views are, but I, you know, have done nothing wrong. And it's, it's really unfortunate that they've had to suffer in this way because of the actions of their, their president. Yeah. Uh, Charlotte, what do you think? Uh, I think it's appalling. Um, What's appalling? And I think it's appalling that they are being stopped, banned from playing at Wimbledon. And I think it's really, really important here that we make a distinction between the state of Russia... Uh, Putin and anyone who is enabling him and, you know, supporting his war. And then whether you call it ordinary Russians or, you know, I mean, let's put, let's put, I mean, an elite 
uh, athlete is clearly not quite an ordinary person, but let's put them in that category. And I think it's really important we split those things. And there are ways of enabling um, Russian athletes to compete at the highest level, um, which wouldn't require you to endorse the Russian flag, the Russian state. So, for example, a completely different issue, but uh, at the Olympics, um, we had a ban on Russia competing in the Olympics due to the uh, drug scandal. So Russian uh, athletes can compete under a neutral mm. ban. So there's no reason why that couldn't have been implemented here. And the thing that I guess worries me the most about this is actually there's a risk that, that I mean, Ellie's right. On one side, maybe by banning athletes, you do somehow encourage uh, the Russian people to put greater pressure and, and hopefully, you know, in some way to topple Putin. But actually, the flip of that is that you further cement this idea that the West are anti-Russian. And that's really dangerous because the war will end at some point. Um, what we need from that is a Russia that can come out of it looking very different and actually being brought into the fold, not being uh, rejected. And given all of the anti-Western propaganda we know is already going on in Russia, I think we've got a risk of feeding into this by banning legitimate athletes. And it's not true to say that the athletes haven't, um, uh, or, or at least some of them haven't said something, because there was precisely a Russian elite tennis player who at one of the matches, I for, forgive me, I forget which one it was, actually wrote on the screen an anti-war slogan. So I think but it's the really... the side of that, wasn't it a gymnast? And I have to confess, I'm going from memory here, I've not thinged it, but wasn't it a gymnast that he had um, a Z? A Z. Yeah. On his chest. But, but then you would say, well, that gymnast, um, in the model where you say you can't stand under the Russian flag because it's the state, the mm -hmm. Russian state, we want to see as and is a pariah, um, then that gymnast, if they were to show, I think, an affiliation to the state, and that is a proxy affiliation, then I think you would be legitimate in saying, do you know what, you can't compete now. But for those athletes who want to just get on with their sport, want to be able to compete and are happy to compete in a neutral stance, then I think we should be welcoming that. Mm. Kevin? Uh, I think we're losing the plot. <clears throat> Absolutely losing Who? the plot. Wimbledon, uh, uh, Wimbledon. I mean, uh, banning R Russian individual players because of a political situation in Ukraine, I think it's irrational. I think it's anti-Russian hysteria at its worst. I think it's Russia phobia. Mm -hmm. And when you target individuals like that, let me be very clear, Michelle, and that means my words, and I know what I'm saying, I've thought it through. The English Tennis Law and Association, whatever you call the tennis people who organise Wimbledon, they are racist. You are pure and absolute racist. This is racism of the worst kind. We are taking individual Russian people because of their nationality and we are banning them. Now, the point that you just made, Charlotte, is well made. One of the leading players took a pe pen onto the actual camera and said, give peace a chance, actively oppose Putin's war, and we are turning them all with the same brush. Now, here's the point, Michelle. Once you do this with Russian players, this is one slippery slope you're on. Where does this end? Now, everybody wanted to criticise Saxons of the left when they engaged in boycotts of Israel and boycotts and diverse sanctions, etc. And I understand why they were criticising those left-wing academics, but now you have a situation where, in a much more high-profile case, we're doing the exact same to Russian people. This is a disaster, and it makes me worry about the whole idea of sanctions. It's making me really rethink where we're at. Um, I, I, I've, I struggled to be even one iota sympathetic towards this ban, and I, 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 I'm fascinated to know what the average listeners think about this. But what about what Ellie was um, saying, though? She mentioned in terms of it happening when there was apartheid and it being quite successful uh, and changing... Ellie is completely wrong about Players apartheid. Uh, by the way, apartheid, uh, apartheid's work, wrong. Yeah. It's completely not true. This is one of these historical myths. I mean, you know, if you want to read a few history books about apartheid South Africa, the boycotts were absolutely nothing to do with why we ended apartheid in South Africa. Absolutely zero. It was to do with the collapse of the Soviet Union. It was to do with the problem within the ANC. It was to do with the clerk pick in the right moment to draw them into negotiations. I'm happy to have a conversation about South Africa. And by the way, here's a really interesting question. You know, if it worked... There's other examples if it, no, of boycotts. Fair enough, fellow mate, but you can have a conversation about, well, might this work? But even if you thought it would work, I'd still be against it. It is racist. It's pure and absolute racist against ordinary Russian people who are individuals who think all different things. 
But then I suspect that, that you would not approve of, because I have to say this is something that I find incredibly bizarre. Uh, this is UK's sports minister, Nigel Huddleston. He was saying at one point that Russian players should provide, I quote, written assurances yeah. that they don't support and are yeah. not in collusion yeah. with Vladimir Putin. Yeah. I've got to be honest, I found that that's a bit weird. So let's put a target on, let's put a big target on their chest or on their back. Can you imagine those players coming out with those statements and then having to go back home to their families? The guy's obviously exactly what I mean by people losing the plot. Well, Ellie, what was you going to say? No, I think I think that's really unfair to ask mm. those players to do that because I agree with Kevin. You are you, you're setting them up in an impossible situation. Then either they withdraw from the tournament they want to be in, or they risk making themselves a target for the Putin administration. I think that's a completely unrealistic demand. I think they should they should have a consistent. Like, I think the sports bodies should have a consistent policy on how to handle the situation. And it should not involve putting athletes in the firing line like that. I think that's completely unfair. Well, Alex says, to be honest, your panellists are totally missing the point. He says, uh, it's the message that the ban sends to the Russian people that matters. And it's not about the individuals. But you see, Alex, then my question to you would be, what message do you think it is going to send back to the individuals and ideally to, um, you know, the Russian population? Do you think it's going to send back Putin is awful? Or, to Charlotte's point, do you think uh, it's going to send... And I guess uh, also, to Kevin's point, that it's going to send back the message to the Russian people that actually look at the West. They are um, essentially discriminating against you, the Russian person. Um, uh, you know, what's, I'd be interested in your view. What message do you think it will send back? I've got to say, and I'd be interested in my panel's views on this as well, some of the things that's going on at the moment around this Ukraine-Russia war, which... Of course, nobody sane-minded would condone. It's a horrific situation. But I almost feel like people have gone into virtue signalling overdrive. They can't wait to tell everyone how much they oppose this war. They're changing their profile pictures uh, on all social media. They're desperate to tell everyone that they're trying to get a refugee from Ukraine into their home. And I just, oh, they're trying to remove businesses out of the Russian markets. And I sit there and I think, but hang on a second, because if what you're saying to me is that you really oppose kind of, um, I don't know, conflicts, wars, genocides, human rights abuses, whatever it is, what about all the rest of them? that happen in the world. Why don't so many people focus on those? And then people will say to me, well, it's about the proximity, Michelle. It's because uh, Ukraine is in Europe and it's close to home. So then I respond to that. What about the plights of all the people that are suffering in this country if, you, if proximity is your driver? There's so many people, uh, when we talk about opening homes up and having vulnerable people uh, come and uh, get, get shelter, get aid, all of which, of course, I support. But there's a lot of people in the UK that could do with that kind of urban Opening, uh, opening up an outreach of support from citizens here as well. Let me know your thoughts on that. Get in touch, gbviews at gbnews.uk. Tweet me at Michelle Jubes or at gbnews. Now, let's talk, shall we? Prince Harry. Am I going to go to a break or shall I talk, to, uh, talk about Prince Harry? I'm going to talk about Prince Harry, so I'm being told. Now, what do we think to this? You'll be familiar by now, of course, that this is a prince that apparently wants to protect his privacy. Got to say, it goes a bizarre way about it, though, doesn't it? He's doing deals all over the place with media outlets, so it seems. Um, and today, he's done, or at least it's been broadcast today, a one-on-one -on -one interview with NBC, the Today Show there. Uh, he's talking about his visit to his grandma, the Queen, on Sunday. He says he wants to make sure she's been protected and has the right people around her. Got to say, there's been a lot of criticism, though, of his comments, uh, a lot of calls of hypocrisy, of course, because him and Meghan didn't attend Prince Philip's memorial. Um, and he's also, hasn't he, let's be fair about this, caused a lot of controversy uh, on his family, towards his family. But let's have a little listen to some of the things that he was saying. It's just so nice to see her. You know, she's on. She's on great form. We always. She's always got a great sense of humour uh, with me, and I'm just making sure that she's, you know, protected and got the, the right people around. Well, her. you you make her laugh. That's what she always says. Uh, I, did you do it again? Uh, yes. Yeah, I did. Uh, both <laughs> Megan and I had tea with her, so it was it was really nice to catch up with her. And you know, home home for me now is is, is you know for the time being. It's in the, it's in the, it's in the states. states. Well, uh, let me know your thoughts on that. And Charlotte, for now, yours. 
Uh, well, we said at the start, didn't we, we were, we were all a bit sick of Partygate and hearing constantly about, you know, kind of who had drunk what at what time in, in what place. And I, I sort of feel a bit like this with the whole Harry, Meghan, royal family saga in that I don't really care what Harry and Meghan are doing. Can I say that? Um, I'm just going to say whatever you want. <laughs> but I do think, you know, on the specific question of, of uh, again, coming back, I suppose, to the hypocrisy that we, we were talking about earlier, um, I do think it's at least a bit rich for uh, Prince Harry to be coming out, sort of expressing concern about uh, the Queen and the support that she has around him when, uh, you know, he has, one can assume or one would assume, caused deep and immense pain for her uh, in in leaving the, the, the family and going over to America and, and some of the things clearly that, that he has been saying. Um, I also think it's, you know, it's interesting, isn't it? So, you know, a lot of people have pointed this out, but he didn't come over for the Prince Philip Memorial. Um, he's come over now, but kind of because it's convenient, because he's on his way to the Invictus Games. And don't get me wrong, the Games are, are, are a brilliant thing that he set up for injured um, uh, former servicemen. But, you know, it's kind of on his terms. So if you're talking about wanting to be there for the Queen, his granny, uh, and, and make sure there's the, the right support around her, might he think about being there at times she needs him and not just when it's conveniently en route to something else he's going to? Mm. Karen? Um, I'm a Republican myself. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, I'm an Irish Republican uh, and I wouldn't have any time for the royal family. And if this ha helps to like promote or raise a debate about becoming a republic, that, that would be a good thing. That said, the old woman, Elizabeth, I'm not against her. You know, she's a decent early human being. I think... Well, I, I'm the counter. I, I love the Queen. Well, first so. lady of Charlotte, <laughs> I've nothing against her personally. I'm just a bit of a Republican. But do you know what this reminds me of? This reminds me of Netflix. It's like, it's the line between celebrity and royalty. Which mm. is which? It's like you're watching, like, I'm smiling to myself from a, from a distance. Like, what are we actually watching here? Um, are we watching The Crown? I we even call that program mm. on, on Netflix. And I think um, it's like everybody's celebrity watching, hanging on his word. But Michelle, am I allowed to say I'm not that interested in it, really? It's just a little bit Get like... Get out. It's <laughs> just, out. Yeah, sorry, sorry I've got nothing more profound than that to say. <laughs> um, it's funny you should mention that about the whole blur, between the whole blaring of the lines, because um, the former um, MP David Miller, he, Tory MP, he was on GB News earlier on today, and he was saying it's almost like they're in danger of becoming, like, Kardashian-esque. Exactly. Prince Harry. Yeah. Uh, someone else has just written in Peter, by the way, saying, why do you keep calling him Prince Harry? That is still his title, isn't it? I'm not wrong in that. I, thought, I think he's still a prince. Yeah. Uh, anyway, I'm sure you out there will correct me if I am indeed wrong. Um, but yeah, I thought he was still Prince Harry. But anyway, Ellie, what's your thoughts on all this? Well, I feel like I should say I really care about it now, <laughs> just to uh, <laughs> the other. Harmless, but yeah, I don't... I suppose, I mean, I'm a half Irish Republican, um, but I feel the same way as you. I don't have anything personally against any of the royal family. And I, and I guess, I, feel, I suppose my, I think that their obligations to the British people, because they're, they're sort of, they're, they, they're funded by the British people and, and they're there to sort of represent us almost. I think, you know, I think they're ob obliged to basically conduct themselves well in public life and to sort of turn up to the things that they're supposed to turn up to. And... Um, you know, carry out their royal duties. But beyond that, I, I think they are allowed to be human beings and it is okay for Harry to fall out with his parents and that is something that happens in a lot of families and it's, it's kind of okay. That, and I but, think they should just be allowed to have an argument like a normal family would. But then what do you think too? Because families do fall out, um, they certainly do. But at the end of the day, if you're such a public family and a loved family by a lot of people, a lot of people genuinely adore the royal family. And I think what Harry did in his Oprah, I don't even want to call it an interview because that was not an interview. That was basically an advertorial for uh, Harry and Meghan to say pretty much whatever they wanted unchallenged. And one of the things that they said in that interview, which made me uncomfortable actually, was that they the basically just turned around and essentially said, someone in the royal family is a racist. Obviously, I'm paraphrasing the words there, but that was the essence of what they said. Mm. They left it hanging then so that people were sitting there and trying to work out, well, who is the racist mm. in the royal family? Now, if indeed you believe that a member of your family is a racist, like genuinely a racist, and your wife is mixed race, you wouldn't have any kind of 
you know, desire to protect them. So if you wanted to name and shame that person, then you would. And I think what he did to basically uh, throw his whole family under the bus, under the kind of uh, a, a shadow of suspicion, I thought it was really, really wrong. Well, you know, on the racist family members thing, I think quite a lot of us have got family members um, who, we ha who have views that we disagree with. And, you know, I mean, I have family members whose views I disagree with. Um, I wouldn't call them racist, certainly not, but they, but we disagree. And I, I still love them, and I, and I wouldn't want to slag them off on national TV, you but know, Mark, so I do... Would you mention it, then? So if you didn't want to slag them off on TV, which is perfectly understandable, by the way, why bring it up? Well, I think in that interview, I think um, both, both Harry and Meghan seem to want to talk about... Um, the painful experiences they'd been through. Um, and they wanted to do that in a way that didn't sort of name people that they were close to in their family, which, which I do understand. And you know, the other thing I would say as well is that, like, it, I do find it strange seeing paparazzi photos of Prince Harry like he is just any other celebrity, because, you know, he's the same age as me. I grew up with Prince Harry being on TV all the time as a royal. So seeing him now in this kind of celebrity space is very strange. But I think the big difference between someone like Prince Harry and someone like Kim Kardashian is that Kim Kardashian chose to be famous and she relentlessly pursued fame and she's done really well out of it. Whereas um, Prince Harry was sort of born into that life and he didn't choose it. And I think now that has led him with, led, left him with very limited options about with what he can do with his life in future. You know, he has to have a lot of security because he's so high profile. Um, and it's not as though he can sort of go and work in a McDonald's or, or you know, be a teacher like Kevin or uh, run a bank or whatever it might be, you know, because of, because of who he is. He's world famous. And so, so I suppose I have a bit more sympathy with him over that because he, and I hear what you're saying about them being a public family, but it's not something that he chose. It was something that he was born into and it's something that he's clearly struggled with his whole life. And... You know, actually, I do think that the one thing that many members of the royal family agree with is that they would like the press to butt out of their affairs a little bit, and I do understand that. Come off it. One breath they say, I want the press to butt out yeah. of my affairs, and then in the next breath, they're there, hanging around the media, doing multi-million million pound deals with the media. And if you want to be in the media, making tens of millions of pounds from the media, then you can't then start crying when you get the flip side of that fence, which is people taking an interest in you. Let me know what you think. GBviews at gbnews.uk. Tweet me at Michelle Jubes or at gbnews. Going to take a quick break. When we come back, I'll have some of your emails and social responses. Lots of you have been in touch on some of those stories we've already covered. And I want to talk to you as well about self-driving cars. Would you get in a driverless car? Apparently, there's been some changes to the highway code proposed that means that if you're in one uh, or in control of one, you'll be able to sit back chill out and watch GB News. Well, obviously, other programmes uh, are available, but why would you want to watch anything else here? But, get this, you can watch telly in those cars, but you can't use your phone. Makes no sense to me, does it to you? I'll see you in a couple of minutes. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes & Co. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates and strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7, on Jubes & Co. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's Brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6, on GB News. 
Hello, I'm Patrick Christie's. And I'm Mercy Moroki. Make sure that you join us Monday to Thursday, 10 a.m. until midday, right here on GB News for To The Point. We're not afraid to talk about the topics that matter to you or the big topics that always matter. We cover absolutely everything from the breaking political stories of the day to law and order, what's going on in the channel. We're not afraid to hold people to account. We always make sure we include your views on our show. Indeed, if you're thinking it, you can guarantee that we're saying it. So make sure you join the conversation with us 10 a.m. until midday, Monday to Thursday, for To The Point on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello there, welcome back to Jubes & Co with me, Michelle Jubilee. Let me just quickly remind you as to my panel this evening, we've got Director of the Reform Think Tank and former advisor to Ian Duncan Smith, Charlotte Pickles, teacher and author, Kevin Rooney, and Director of the Centre for Labour and Social Studies, Ellie May O'Hagan. Uh, I have to say, lots and lots of you guys have been in touch. Um, this, uh, pretty much all of the topics that we discuss, there's never any kind of mass consensus. Lots of you have different opinions, which by the way, I think is great. So I think it's healthy to have different opinions, disagree, uh, long way that continue. I tell you, Robert is not mincing his words though. He says, tell this disgraceful person, I'm assuming you mean Harry, to stay in the US. I don't want to see his face on the front pages of our papers, never mind anyone giving him interviews on television. Susan says, uh, Prince Harry is delusional. His Oprah interview was incredibly hurtful to the Queen and must have caused <coughs> her a great deal of anguish. Um, yeah, interesting. Deb says, though, I totally agree with Prince Harry. Uh, and she says, the Queen does need the right people about uh, around her. Uh, I've just realised. You then, your last sentence to that, Deb, is, so Prince Harry should hurry back to the US. I thought I'd found it. I thought I'd found an email and that was pro Prince Harry. Hence, I was I was reading it out with gusto. But there you go. If you agree, actually, uh, with Prince Harry, you think that he is doing the right thing, coming back now to support his grandma, then get in touch and let me know. Um, anyway, let's talk about driverless cars very quickly, shall we? Um, would you get in one is my first question. Um, I have been in one. I didn't like it. I didn't feel very safe. But would you? Would you be comfortable with that? Um, apparently, they're not far off. And now, under proposed changes to the highway code, if you own one of these uh, driverless cars, you'll be able to watch uh, telly whilst you're driving along. Uh, you won't be able to use your mobile phone, though. That will remain illegal. I mean, I don't even see how that would even work. Anyway, uh, apparently, if there's a collision, it would see insurance companies become liable for the claims uh, if the car was in driverless mode. So what do we think to this? Uh, Kevin, driverless cars, your thing? Are they the future? Uh, uh, you know, uh, there's a bit of a counterintuitive thing about them. It's a bit, I feel a bit strange about it, but then when I step back in my second breath, I think God bless technology and science and innovation and progress. It's actually brilliant. And I think it's very good for the older people as well. Uh, and people who might have certain infirmities. So I think that's a very happy story. But can I, can I think about something out loud and the rest of our panellists could tell me if I'm wrong? I detect the wee subtext in this discussion, which is almost a distrust of drivers, a distrust of drivers using their sort of independent judgment and their independent decision making. Well, do you know what percentage of recorded road collisions apparently down to human fault? Uh, tell me. I was going to say, don't ruin my little thing and know the answer, yeah, because that would be a bit rubbish. Does anyone know on this panel what percent of road collisions, the recorded ones, have human error as a factor in them? I reckon high. I don't know what the number is, but I reckon high. Very high. Wouldn't you even know where to Just hazard a guess, you three. It was uh, 70, 80%. 70%. 30%. 80%. 88%. I was closest. 88%. I said 80. <laughs> oh, did you say, yeah, I think it's 8. No, 80. 88% oh, <laughs> okay. of recorded road collisions apparently have human error as a factor in them. Yeah. So, Trev's just emailed and saying driverless cars is going to be a disaster, but does that make you think on? Uh, now that I've just told you that stat, Trev. Uh, Ellie? Your thoughts on these driverless cars? Would you get in one? Would I get in one? Um, probably on a not very busy road. Yeah, 
Just to try it, but I'd probably be like in central London, probably not. No. But like I'm from North Wales, in North Wales, probably. I'd give it a go. If it was in a field, maybe. Just Might to have give like it a, go. a cow or a sheep or something, though, get in the way. That's... Would, you, yeah. would yeah. you get in I one, mean, Charlotte? You're joking, but yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, <laughs> would, I, would I get in one? Yeah, would um, you? I actually really like driving. <laughs> so I kind of think there's also a bit of a spanner in the, the works here in that. Um, no, I'd be terrible, I think, is the, is the short answer. But also, I think a lot of people who drive actually really enjoy it. And so I think there's some convincing to do to say that actually it's a, it would be a better experience to have a driverless car. But I do take the point about elderly people or, or disabled people it could be amazing for. You know, I think there are certain groups for whom this could be really liberating. But, but for me personally, I think I'd be terrified and I quite like driving, so I'll probably stick with my old-fashioned... I don't fashion. even like cruise control. No. I don't even like... I don't, I don't have an automatic much. even. You know, I like, I like the gears. You know, I like doing the hard work in a car. <laughs> Hmm. No, I agree with you, Charlotte, and I hope they give us the choice. If this yeah. is the way of the future and we start to get these driverless cars, I'd hate to get the situation where we end up being almost forced to have one. Although that could be the most dangerous scenario, actually, when you have driverless and drivers on the road. You sort of need to go one way or the other. Why? Because apparently what, some of the risk to the driverless cars and when you have accident is actually not being able to predict what the driving cars that's obviously not the right phrase to use but the being able to predict what people given the 88 percent figure that you gave us the risk actually to driverless cars is someone in a in a car who is driving doing something that the car then can't respond to quickly enough so are you telling me that they're going to go collect all cars are banned did you so drive? they're talking about having lanes where it will one. stop which will only be driverless cars for those lanes and there'll be some form of technology gosh i mean we're getting into stuff i don't i, I should probably stop at this point but but, but yes these will be the risks okay, they have to think through <laughs> when society used to be transported by horse and carts and then, you know, all of these conversations yep. about these things Absolutely. called motor cars, yes. that all these people were having these grand ideas <laughs> about kind of, yeah, we're going to have cars. I would love to have been a fly in the wall for yes. a conversation now because yeah. we all take motor cars for granted, don't we? Most of us uh, get in them, uh, have them, whatever it is. And here we are now talking about something yeah. that in a few years' time, they'll probably uh, be the norm. Yeah. And we won't believe that people, you know, we'll sit there and tell our grandkids, well, well, you know, we used to have these cars with these gear <laughs> sticks and we used to sit in our first gear and this and that and the other. And they'll look at us like they're absolutely Mad. bonkers. Philip has emailed in and said, but Michelle, would I get into a driverless bus? No, he says in capital letters. Uh, Nigel says, well, can a driverless car find a parking space? I would say, yeah, I think even my car uh, can find a car parking space, but I don't know how to use it. Uh, another pizza says, if you don't want to drive a car, simple, catch the bus. Uh, lots of you, basically. Ian says, does this mean I could go for a night on the sauce then and I won't get done <laughs> yes. for drink driving? Well, the two panels say <clears throat> yes, but I actually don't think it does mean that. I think if you have a driverless car, at least in the beginning, uh, you have to uh, be able yes. to take control of it. Finally, Anthony has emailed in a massive capital letter saying, dear Michelle, is there any subject in the entire world that you don't have a self-opinion on? No, there is this not. This is an opinion show. And it, yes, exactly. Show, that's the case. <laughs> Ellie, Kevin, Charlotte, thank you very much for your company tonight. Thank you at home for yours. Have a great evening and I'll see you same time tomorrow. Hello, I'm Luke Meyer with your weather forecast. And for the next few days, we've got a lot of dry weather around across the UK. There will be some sunshine from time to time, but we will start to see the risk of some showers across the south. With high pressure over Scandinavia. That's keeping our weather fairly settled across the UK at the moment, keeping these weather fronts out towards the west at bay. They're not the ones to worry about, but we may see some showers developing from the south as we go in towards the weekend. But for the rest of Wednesday night and into Thursday, a lot of clear skies across the country. So a chilly night to come. Could be a touch of frost, particularly for sheltered parts of Scotland. And across eastern Scotland, we will also see some low cloud and ha drifting in from the North Sea. Temperatures two to five as we start the day on Thursday. But for many of us, it's a bright and sunny start. Any early morning mist or fog should clear away fairly quickly. And then a lot of sunshine across the UK through Thursday. Away from that is that North Sea coast, particularly northeast England, southeast Scotland, where we could see some low cloud. Now, there will be a bit more cloud across the southwest and across Wales through the afternoon. But in any sunshine, still likely to see temperatures 
18 degrees Celsius, but as I say, cooler on that east coast as we begin to see a bit more of an easterly breeze feeding in. Now that's going to become more of a feature of our weather over the next few days. Through Thursday night, it will drag in a lot more low cloud across eastern parts of England and Scotland, so fairly grey, fairly misty in places as we start the day on Friday. The best of any clearer skies will be out towards the west, but with more breeze and more cloud, temperatures won't be quite as low as we start Friday morning. So not as chilly first thing, but you will have the added impact of that wind. Cloud will be thick enough at times across southern areas to give one or two showers from time to time, so less in the way of sunshine here. I think the best of the sunshine will be further north, particularly northwest Scotland, having the lion's share of the sunshine here. Now it stays fairly mixed in towards the weekend, dry for most, a few showers across the south, and those temperatures just trending down slightly. Bye-bye. <laughs>